Christianity has the influence to help people help themselves and give the credit to God. Neri Shabaka, Ursa Ma'at Ra, and knowledge is infinite. Therefore, evolution is inevitable. Peace. Shift TV 314. This is your brother, Pianki Patamatulu Neferamon Ra. And this is another episode of Paradigm Shift TV 314. Today we have a powerful show with a powerful brother. Goes by the name of Chris Harris. Before I let him speak his speech, I'm going to do my usual spiel. I'm going to say hotel to my fellow comedic brothers and sisters. I'm going to say God bless to my Christian brothers and sisters. I'm going to say Shalom to my Hebrew Israelite brothers and sisters. I'm going to say Islam to my Moorish brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum to my brothers and sisters in the NOI and Jambo. To the rest of my brothers and sisters throughout the African dysphoria, be it here in the wilderness of the United States of America or beyond. I say that welcome for one reason and one reason only. It's because if you are black, I'm with you and I hope that you are with me. Our different ideologies shouldn't keep us from uniting. We can disagree without being disrespectfully disagreeable. And with that, brother, introduce yourself to the Paradigm Shift TV 314 audience. Let's get into it. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing, Paradigm Shift TV? My name is Christopher Harris. Um, I'm a debater on what they call the conscious circuit. And um, I'm very adverse to the biblical scriptures. Um, I teach that they're mythologies and most of them are, and it's been proven to be corrupted pyramid and coffin texts and other mythologies taken from parts of Nubia, Kemet, and Mesopotamia. And we must free our minds from the mythology and begin to awaken ourselves so we can see that divinity is not within a book, it's from within. Wow, and that's, that's peace. So now you know a lot of people, uh, particularly those who uh, come from a, a Christian background and can consider themselves uh, Christian scholars, uh, Hebrew Israelite scholars. I'm sure they've attacked you, and you know you you've been up against them. And of course, they'll say that that that's uh, pseudo, uh, one of the favorite words that they like to throw around. What what was it that you studied uh, in that paradigm that that solidified for you that that was uh, the truth? Mm, it goes it goes a little further. Um, it's a little bit deeper than that. Um, but I think it all started when I first started hearing about the tale of Heru Baal-Det. And I read about that tale and um, I was at the library one day and um, I had my fringes on, you know what I'm saying? I was a Hebrew, Torah only, the whole nine. Wow, okay. Okay. Yeah, this is what most people don't know. And um, 
I was happened to be at the library and a gentleman came up to me and he said, hey man, I noticed you're always here at the library and you're always reading and studying. What is it that you're reading? And I was reading, um, I would always, I was reading Babylon, the 10 book to a lot of what we would call Hebrew Israelite sources. You know what I'm saying? And so he says, okay, so you like Rudolph Windsor's books? And I said, yeah. So he states and he says, okay, okay, okay. He left. So he came back one day and um, he happened to bring back a book. He said, if I give you a book, do you promise to read it? And I said, yeah. He, I said, yeah, I'll read it. And he says, okay, are you a Hebrew Israelite? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an Israelite. You know, I'm, you know, you know, when you're indoctrinated, right, right, you know, right, you're right. like, no, I'm an Israelite, <laughs> you know, Deuteronomy 28, verse 68, brother. So um, he said, okay, I want you to read this book. And it was a book by, the, um, by Chancellor Williams, and it was called The Destruction of the Black Civilization. Mm. So I had began to read it, and I began to reject it at the same time because the historical narrative that he was teaching in there was not the historical narrative that I read about in the biblical canon. Okay. So I, the, I saw the gentleman again and he said, how was that book? And I was like, uh, it's okay. He said, well, knowledge, there's nothing to be afraid of when you're dealing with knowledge. And I said, okay. And he said, just don't highlight the parts that suit you read the whole book and understand what it's trying to put forth. So um, I still went there every day. It was a Barnes and Noble. I went there every Saturday to go read. So um, he then brought me a book by Thomas Doan called Ancient um, Near East um, Mythologies in the Biblical Texts. So I opened up that book and I remember how when I was reading about the story of Abraham and how it was inspired by the contentions of Haru and Set and reading about the, the story of the flood, which was Noah's Ark and how that was inspired from the Gilgamesh, I remember the fear that came over me. So I just closed the book and I never read it. I, I, I stopped reading it. And, you know, I was telling people like, yeah, man, this guy, he bringing me all this stuff about other religions and you know how it is, right? So the entire time I was fighting it and I just kept opening it up and reading it and reading it. So um, I was not a YouTube fan. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't a YouTube fan or anything like that. And one day I just happened to turn on YouTube and um, I remember I was just, I looked at an Egyptian documentary and there was a gentleman on there by the name of Ashwa Kwesi that I mm. began to look at, right? And <laughs> he began to show the walls and he began to show the stories that were on the walls. And my, I remember how the fear is called cognitive dissonance. The yes, fear sir. that came over me that I saw when I, he, he showed the, then I saw Dr. Ben, um, Dr. Joseph Yahoo, I'm sorry, Dr. Ben. Um, I saw, John, I, I, I came across John Henry Clark. And I'm telling you guys, this is all like, I'm 40 years old and this was all a matter of what, this was seven years ago. So they were, they weren't trying to destroy the biblical um, um, mythologies. They were trying to show its origins and where they came from. So when that fear came over me, I just started reading Black Man of the Nile. I started reading Dr. John Henry Clark. I started, look, I, I started looking at the Ashwar Kwesi videos. I got in touch with Mr. Kwesi himself. And oh, he no. said, um, wow. yeah, I heard him on a radio show, a public uh, broadcast radio show. And I just called in and I said, do you have any books that you would recommend me? And uh, one of the books um, he recommended me to was Echoes of the Dark Land by Dr. Charles Finch III. I went and got that book. And when I tell you, I just started reading and reading and reading and reading and just doing um, studying and studying, I began to see like, wait a minute. Okay, so if it's all false, I could take these fringes off. I can go outside on Saturday now. It was, a re it was like, like a release, you know what I'm saying? And somewhat when you hear me uh, go against the biblical narrative, I do sound rebellious. But sometimes you have to be like this when you're trying to wake your people up from certain um, paradigms. 
So um, as I read all of them, I began to study. Um, I never wanted to read the pyramid texts because I felt like Psalms and Proverbs were all corrupted pyramid texts. And I said, so, okay, so I have them. But I spoke to another gentleman by the name of Jamar Milton. And these are all people on YouTube <laughs> that you will begin to meet. It's nothing you can do about it. And they yeah. will say, read the pyramid texts and study them and you will see it for yourself. So I went and bought Surf Lenders Petrie. I went and bought uh, Voices of Our Ancestors uh, by Per Ot Ma'at Ra. Um, I went and bought all these and I began to study them and I began to see, wait a minute, this is the story of Jesus. Haru is serving people bread. Wait a minute, wait a, wait a minute. And it was this all like this. So now I'm like this, like the <sighs> comes off, right? And that anger begins to set in because you begin yeah. to say, like, why would we be lied to like this? And and now it's almost like what keeps us in this lie? Here it is. The biblical narrative told us that our insults were evil. They were maniacal people. Right? Right. So what it is when we see these things and we read about these things. Don't go back up into Egypt. I take it back to my um, elders and I say, hey guys, I want y'all to take a look at this. Look at what this, the story of Hathor. Look at the destruction of man. Look at Haru Odet. These stories come right out of here. Look at the story of Sinhui. Look at the story of Tutmos III, the liberator of, of, of Kemet, who kicked the so-called Hyksos, which are Israelites, by the way, up out of Kemet and how he banished them. Look at this. We got to read this and we can't ignore this, right? So you see, I said, these are original texts that date way back to the 19th century BCE, right? You're reading all this. And you know what they told me? We hope you go outside and get hit by a bus. Damn. Wow. These were the things they began to tell me. And then they began to shun me. And I'm on any time when I would read about the, the story of the uh, plagues in Egypt, right? And I'm on, like, all of this is the story of the golden lotus flower, right? All of this... All of these stories are already in Kemet, especially with Sinhui, right? And I'm all like this. We inspired them, like the Iwapur papyrus. That, all that was inspired by that. They got the story from here. You can't extrapolate certain histories from our ancient ancestors and then say, this is, this is it happened. See, read this. They'll tell you to read it, but they, they exegete certain verses out of it, but they won't read all of it. And then I was just all like, so after a while, I remember I, I would just tell everybody, I started, I would just be kind of afraid, sort of afraid. And I began to look at YouTube and see the debates. Because I used to debate the uh, Christians because I was a Torah only, but I would see the debates and I would see the energy that these brothers had, like polite, and not that I'd ag I agree with everything he says, right. I would say polite or Sarasu and Seti and and I would just be all like, man, they're not even afraid of this book, right? And you would see them really going in on it and showing that it's just that it's a book, nothing more. And as I began to study history, because that's what I love to study history, I love studying history and comparative mythology. One of the things I say in the book with Jesus is he says, um, the temple, the temple of man the temple of God is within man. He who knows himself shall know eternal life. And I'm like, but it's written on the walls of Karnak. <laughs> it's written right there on the wall. Man. I am that I am. Nupat Nup is written on most of the temples that were in Kemet. And so, so when I saw it and when I began to study it, I'm all like this, like, man, the book is not divine right? Divinity comes from within. And then I begin to hate the book somewhat because the way it shuns African spirituality. So you understand what I'm saying? If you will, because when you, when you mentioned how it portrays uh, the, the ensues, I always say it's an anti-African book. Yes, it is. Because of how it portrays Africans as villains, whether it's uh, the curse of Canaan, uh, Pharaoh being the villain of one of their most, probably their most important story. Speak to that, if you if you will, 
on how it is definitely an anti-African book because some people think that that's a misunderstanding, but I, I think it's clear. No, it, it's, it's very, let, uh, let's get one thing clear. The biblical narrative is anti-African, first of all, because it doesn't allow you to partake in anything African. Now, when we read about the biblical narrative, the first thing that you see in Exodus is the cursing of a civilization, of the Nile Valley. And you see him plaguing the animals, plaguing the crops, plaguing the all, killing all the firstborn. You see all of these things going on within Kemet. All right, or within the um, excuse me, within the biblical narrative. Right now, it's so that makes it anti-African. It you're not not allowed to be polytheistic, right? You're not allowed to call upon other gods, right? You're not allowed to um, pay reverence to your ancestors, right? But when we look at the biblical narrative itself, pause. Let's go back for a minute. When you read about the story of Hezekiah. It said he kills a group of people of Ham who dwelt in the land of old, there from the, land, from the days of old. It said a peaceable people. And it said he slaughtered them all. And he's supposed to be a, this benevolent king. And it praised him for doing that. Absolutely. It praised him for doing that. So, when you read about the curse of Canaan, how can you curse somebody who ain't even born yet? Canaan wasn't even born yet. Right. He, he, his, his, his father did it. He didn't even do it. He, he didn't even do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. when, when, you, when you look at the biblical narrative, such as you get the story of Moses. Now, Moses is 40. We know the story. Moses is 40 years old. He realizes after eating in the, Af in the Pharaoh's house for over 40 years, he a Hebrew Israelite. Right. So when that takes place, he kills the Pharaoh soldier and he flees out of Kemet. Watch this. He killed the Pharaoh soldier and he fled out of Kemet. And before he fled, one of the Hebrews told him, what you gonna do, kill me like you did Pharaoh soldier? So he knew he was wrong when he did it. So God giving him a law on the mountains was nothing new because we already had those laws. You see, these are the things I try to tell people to look at when you read the biblical narrative. How did he know what he did was wrong? How did the pharaohs know Abraham was lying to them? They said, why would you lie to me? Oh, I thought y'all was going to try and kill my daughter. I mean, my wife, which was his sister by the way right. and I want everybody to pay attention to the biblical narrative how it's anti-African because throughout the book with the Assyrian kings with the Persian kings with the Greek kings with the Roman um, um, pontiffs and all of that they all got names but when it comes to the African insults they don't have names wow if I may brother you just made a point that I, I and I could just it could just be me I've never heard anybody make that point because I always say every we know every in suit had five at least five royal names at least five and they couldn't give you one couldn't give but you one. like you said with the Persians the Romans the Assyrians they named them all but with the African kings you can't and we know these individuals had multiple names attributed to them with regards to they royal names, mm -hmm. and they couldn't give us one. That's a powerful point, in my opinion. Right. But go ahead and continue. So when we look at the narrative and we see that, in fact, it is anti-African, we have to look at, then once you begin to study ancient Kemet or the land of Tameri, you know, uh, I know that saying Kemet is very, um, people get upset when you say Kemet, so I'll say Tameri or Hekapata. When you study it, their culture and their traditions, they did everything. They were doing certain traditions that the so-called Israelites were already doing, such as the scapegoat routines. They had an altar, which they made sacrifices at. They sprinkled wine on the altar, offered grain offerings, and their priests wore linen, linen clothing with white, and they bathed every day before they went into their temple. As a matter of fact, the Temple of Solomon, believe it or not, since we can never find it, we can only uh, 
we can only be assured that that ideal of that um, temple was copied after that of the Luxor temple with the two pylon pillars in front. It is copied almost, um, it was almost copied the diagram and the Holy of Holies and the inner court and the outer court, all of those things, we were already developing those. We already had those sciences already. When you look at the story of Tutmos III, um, that, it, that story mirrors that of King David. Uh, I'm sorry, King David's story mirrors that of Tutmos III. Because when you take Tutmos III's name and you put it into the Semitic letters, you get DWD. This is where they get the term Dawood from. Tutmos III's son, his firstborn son, died. And he had to appoint his second son, Amenhotep, as king. Amenhotep then what? Built a temple. And you see this also in the story of David when David's son dies, of course, because Yahweh kills him. And then he appoints his son Solomon, and Solomon builds the temple, ironically mimicked right after the temples that were already built in Kemet. So when you see Solomon's name, which means my God is peace, you see Amen Hotep, where it says Amen is peace. So these are the things we have to be able to look at. And when I debate against these people or against my brothers and sisters that are Hebrews, um, Christians really don't care about that. They are more New Testament. I show them no mercy. That's powerful, bro. That's powerful. You teaching. Yeah. You teaching. Yeah. So look, how how long, because I wasn't aware that you were in the Old Testament Israelite, how long were you in that uh in, in that belief before you began to to look towards uh African spiritual uh um I was in said. that for maybe nine years. Wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's why the fear, the fear was um the fear was almost greater than the knowledge that I was acquiring. And you have to understand that when I was still a Torah only, for three years I was studying um, the African um, concepts of spirituality. Okay. You know, I was studying those. And whenever I would make a video or I would go on other people's platforms, I would almost be ashamed to speak of um, African concepts. And um, because people will troll you, talk about you, make videos about you, and you really didn't want to, um, you didn't really want, you really didn't want to become the uh, the dark board for those those videos. And I, after a while, I just began to see the attitudes of the Black Hebrew Israelites and how they would act um, towards that of African spirituality. And I b believe it or not, I don't know what it was, but. I think it was, I heard a lot of false teachings coming out about the Exodus. And I'm all like, no Exodus ever happened. Right. You can't find it <laughs> right. anywhere in history. Right. It definitely didn't happen under Ramses. We know that for a fact. For a fact. Because Ramses wasn't playing no games. Or Usama exactly. Akra, Septep and Ra, with Mesumeriam and the third. That was not happening on his watch. He was playing no games. Exactly. And when you go to Tutmos, which I'm getting ready to have a debate on, I'm all like this, like, what would make you think it was Tutmos? Because there is no consensus that says that. And out of everybody, out of everyone, you dare not mention him as a pharaoh of the Exodus because he put his foot up everybody's tail from the Nile all the way to Euphrates, to the Euphrates. And this is where David gets his stories from of 17 battles unscathed. It was actually Tutmos who warred in the Battle of Megiddo and they thought it was the end of the damn world when he raised hell like he did. So, and he was I've, a brother that looked just like me and you. So, exactly. Yeah. Now, I've heard and I've had, uh, because one thing about me coming out of Christianity, mm -hmm. I still have a love and appreciation for the black church. I don't have any aminous to it. And when, when I talk about the black church, I mean the people, mm -hmm. the, the belief. I have all the eminence and negativity in the world, but the people, I got a lot of love for them. Yes, sir. So I still did. My wife, is, as a matter of fact, is still a very avid uh, Christian. So you can imagine uh, how that that sort of uh, plays out sometimes. But mm -hmm. point being, I still have these conversations. Uh, and you'll see two, of the bro two brothers that, that are commonly on my channel, uh, Christian, you know, 
powerful Christian apologist, uh, and we we chop it up all the time on her. But uh, I bring it up because I've heard Christians say that there's 3,000 year old wreckage in the Red Sea and there are papyruses with, uh, and steles with evidence of the Exodus. What do you say uh, to assertions like that, that just seem to lack veracity with regards to what we know about the history of Kemet versus the biblical uh, text. What, what do you say uh, to that, to those assertions? Um, the problem with Christians is no matter what it is, they want to believe. That's the first thing we have to understand. And when they make these um, citations, those citations that they are making regarding steles, artifacts, or evidence, they make them very arbitrarily. We have to understand that. They somewhat, they're quoting um, other people's work, they have never themselves examined the text and or examined the evidence. And when you go back and you examine the evidence, I want to bring something up like the, um, I think it's the Harris Papyrus, which has slavery in there, right? And it's mentioning Semitic names, right? Now, with the Harris Papyrus, we have so many problems with that because none of those names, albeit they are Semitic, most of those names are alluded, um, if you understand um, epigeography, which is um, such as spelling of names and things, most of those names have Baal in them, like Jacob Baal in them, Jake Anat in them. They're, yes, they are Semitic, but they arbitrarily cite what they want to cite. But when you look at the Hyksos period, which the Harris Papyrus was written, Semites practiced slavery amongst their own. Mm -hmm. And it was, yes, you have a papyrus that came out during the 14th dynastic period, but also it was during the time where Egypt was not in rule. So this is why I say they arbitrarily cite things without any knowledge of the history of Kemet. This is why we, if you don't understand history, you'll you'll fall for it every time and people can trick you from a position of ignorance you understand what i'm saying absolutely yeah when you, go ahead, I'm sorry. okay i just want to say this um when you look at a lot of the um the so-called amorite kings that invaded kemet during the mid mid third millennium bce most of them had names like jacob Abraham, <laughs> they all had those names when they came in there and they they uh, took on throne names of Kemet. So that's what you call the intermediary period when you had kings that belong not on the throne of Kemet um, bringing their practices and of course slavery into Kemet. There is no proof that there's ever been a huge amount of slaves in Kemet escaping and or building the city of Ramses. That's what I want to say. Uh, and that's that's an excellent point. Cause that, and that was kind of in line with, with what I was getting ready to ask you because it seemed like, like you have a few different uh, mind states. You have some Christians or, or Hebrews who will say they were the Hyksos. You have some who will say no. Uh, I've, I've heard people say uh, Hephaestus, and I, I hope I'm saying uh, the queen's name correctly or the or she was actually a chef suit, a chef suit. Mm -hmm. uh, that she was the ruler during the Exodus. Like you have all these different assertions and it's like, why can't you just acknowledge that it's a mythological story about a people who were trying to come into power of their own. It was inspirational, et cetera, but that it didn't really happen. Why, why can't you just acknowledge that? Why does it have to be real or literal? Because anywhere, even when we look at, everybody says they would, uh, Kemet would never admit that this happened. Well, they admit that everything happened, even the things that they were embarrassed about, because that's one exactly. of the things to say about the Bible. The, uh, uh, I forgot, what what is it? The uh, something of embarrassment, right? When they talk about the women uh, discovering Christ's tomb and uh, bad things being said about some of the eyewitnesses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
uh, criterion of embarrassment, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Well, at Kemet, because these priests took a vow to uphold my eye, they were tedious record keepers. So yes. even if they tried to hide it, eventually it would come out in the records. Like the, the, the queen who we, or the female in suit who we just mentioned, they tried, that was covered up. But because of the records, it came out. Yeah. Uh, Akhenaten, same thing. Mm -hmm. So if that actually happened, it would have eventually came out. It, it, am I making sense? Yeah. Um, when we look at the, uh, the story of the Hyksos, during the Hyksos period, you have scribes that are writing about the turmoil going on in Kemet. You have scribes that write and speak about how their people are sorrowed. Um, once again, I'm going to go into the Book of Lamentations that we find in the biblical narrative, most of that which was pulled out of Kemetic texts also, or African texts also. I don't like to separate Egypt from Africa because these people came from the beginning of the Nile. They came right from the, they, they, they're Nubians. That's what they were. As a matter of fact, the Nubians were the ones that always came and set Kemet back in order. Absolutely. This was, that is key. They came up, came up from the beginning of the Nile Absolutely. and set it back in order. As a matter of fact, they're the greatest army to ever exist. Absolutely. It was the Nubians. So um, I want to go into the fact that scroll scribes and Kemet also wrote lamentations about the conditions of their people. And this is once again, when Christians speak, they speak from a position of ignorance, unknowingly. I don't think they're trying to um, lie. I think they just are ignorant of history and things that they don't understand. Yeah, because you mentioned it. Um, I think that, like my namesake, Pianchi, mm -hmm. Nubians would always come up and redeem Kemet because these were the same people. They were the same people. And what, what do you say to people, particularly, again, Christians, because I get this a lot, when we talk about comedic spirituality or comedic science, et cetera, how can you skip over West Africa and mm. go over to Kemet? That's right. What's your, what's your opinion on, on, on that, that critique? I think what we need to um, start to do is begin to embrace West Africa. I think because the uh, conditions that we once saw it in through um, United States, through westernized media, we began to reject it and we jumped all the way into Kemet. Not understanding that many of the practices of the Akan culture, um, Dogon culture, much of it you can find in ancient Kemet. But the thing that we must understand about Africans, African spirituality, or being Africans and learning to embrace our spiritual um, concepts, we must accept that spirituality does, is not set in a bottle. It's not set in a book. It's not freeze frame, right? That's our ritual. Spirituality will continue to evolve because the creator cannot be encapsulated into a book or into any ritual. And this is why when you see the concept of African spirituality, I'm speaking to my um, Christian brothers and sisters right now, when you see the concepts of African spirituality that we find on the West Coast of Africa, you don't find it in books. Ain't nobody writing no books on Ifa chapter two, Mamiwata, the book of Mamiwata chapter one. Nobody's doing that because they understood that they understood and understand that spirituality cannot be encapsulated inside of any ritual practice or book. Those are all Oriental concepts that come out of the Bronze Age period. I'm sorry, not the Bronze, the Iron Age period and with the Greeks and Romans and things like that when they wanted to canonize um, the people they conquered spirituality. Mm. Okay. And that, that's, that's powerful because I think one, one thing that I, I always, and this is my, my, my belief, I think that African spiritual traditions, uh, no matter where you go, 
the Zulu uh, mytho uh, tradition, um, the Yoruba tradition, mm -hmm. the Ifa tradition, the Dome, mm -hmm. as, you, as you mentioned. I think if you look at Kemi, you look at uh, Nubia, I think you see syncretism and similarities in all of them. Not necessarily yes. with the culture of the people, but with regards to how they believed, how how the uh, the deities were represented, what their uh, their particular aspects were, etc. I think you see similarities throughout the continent, even though these people were in different geographical locations around the continent. Right. And so it, it shows you a consistency with the in the minds of the people, even though they were in different different areas throughout the continent. Mm -hmm. and so I think that you you absolutely hit the nail on the head when you say we, we should focus more on those West African uh, spiritual traditions and cultures. Right. If, if not for no other reason than to edify ourselves and to edify people about what it is they represent. So that, that, that is correct. And we also must embrace the citizens of the West Coast of Africa, too. Too many times we want to go up and down the, um, all parts of Africa and say, I'm this group of people, I'm that group of people, no, I'm this group of people. We should not be doing that. We should be embracing them so that they could want to embrace us back. Because we are all now all mixed up, and this is these are the products um, of slavery, and this is what slavery produces. And if you wonder, one of the reasons why I would have a problem with the biblical narrative, because the law clearly says that slavery is okay in the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy. It, it's clearly stated in there that slavery is okay. Um, and if slavery is okay and there's a deity that says it's okay to enslave indigenous cultures and people, then I don't want nothing to do with that deity. I don't want anything to do with his laws. Um, I don't know what else to say. I think we should begin to embrace um, our roots because we know we come from the West Coast of Africa. Right. And I think everything else, until we learn how to embrace who we are, where we're from, we're gonna continue to be in the conditions that we're at, where yeah. we're at now. I agree you know? with that 100%, bro. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can, talk about, uh, because I, I don't know if you saw the title of the, of the, of the show, I put Debate King, Chris Harris. <laughs> yeah. Talk about uh, your, your, your dominance in, uh, in these, uh, in these debate leagues and these debate circuits and, and, and how you uh, kind of start kicking those things, kicking that off? Well, um, the thing I always do is um, when I'm debating, the first thing is if you're not studying and if you're not familiar with the topics that you're debating, you're going to always lose. And you're going to end up doing more pontificating than teaching or edifying the audience. That's what a debate is. You are um, teaching the audience your stance and you are convincing the audience his stance is wrong. This is where you get the negative and the positive from. Um, as far as debating, I had an original picture up there with me holding all three of my trophies that I earned at Solar Vision uh, Debate League. And I took them down because I'm not really a heady guy like that or arrogant guy, but I will, I, I, I can be, but um, I wanted people to hear my message. But debating is easy for me. And um, I always come with primaries. I never lie. I try to tell the truth. Um, I'm <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Christianity sucks, man. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to sit up there and say is when you're debating, because I don't really like talking about myself like this, when you're debating, you just want to have your argument concise. That's all. When you, when you come with your premise, this is how I've learned, because my dad was a lawyer. so. That's how I learned how to debate. He was an attorney. And what he would always do is says, Christopher, here's your premise. This is what you're gonna talk about. Let everybody know what you're gonna talk about. This is ABC, watch this. He said, once you're done with your opening, you let everybody know what you're gonna be talking about, you go into your premise. You discuss your premise in one, two, three, four, five points, right? And that's how you deliver all your information into your finish. He said, in your, rebut in your rebuttal round, you give a review of your premise, 
one, two, three, four, five, right? He said, but you count back from five, four, three, two, one. So, and then you say he never refuted anything because remember, I'm always the negative. I'm not a Christian. You see what I'm saying? And I'm always going against Christianity and you let the audience know he did not refute any of the information or the primaries that I brought to him. Then in your closing, you refudiate him again on the points that he brought forth that had nothing to do with the five points that you were elaborating on in the debate. So really, it's a win-win-win, no matter how you take it. You know, your opening should always explain your premise. Your uh, re refutation should always um, go back over the details of your premise, properly refuting what he has already presented, because he's there to really refute what you bring forth, all right? And then your closing should be a brief summary and um, reminding everyone else again, the flaws in your opponent's argument. So that's the formula I've always went, went with. Most people say Chris is very offensive. Well, my formula is based on offense and to, um, to um, at a very high rate, I think you heard me debating Pastor Bennett where he could not really compete with me. He thought I was going to come with zeitgeist information. And I said, no, that's what most people think. I'm going to come with the information of, that my ancestors left behind for me to see. Um, and um, that's what I came with. That's my style of debating. I know other people don't necessarily do that, but that's my style of debating. And um, I do enjoy debating, but lately it's been bringing the wrong type of energy my way, you know, and um, a lot of the trolling a lot of the uh, immaturity, and um, that's the one thing I'm trying to get away from. That's why I was so happy when you were calling me and you were saying that uh, you wanted me to come over here, and you said you didn't have that big of a platform. It doesn't matter. It's a great platform. It's, it's a great energy, and I, what I will do is I'll let gentlemen and some uh, gentlemen um, that um, that I hold in high esteem by the name of Kansu Sheshmu Amun. I'll let him know about Paradigm Shift Television. Um, I'm pretty sure he would love to come over here. That is a mentor of mine. That is somebody I really look up to. Um, Melvin Jefferson, a lot of intelligent brothers that will um, love to um, share your platform and um, you know maybe even help you with it so it can continue to grow, help it grow. You know, so I definitely appreciate yeah. that, bro. Yeah, no doubt, definitely. no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I you know I think that um, that's a good point. You know, some people hate to lose, bro, and when you when yeah. you're doing that work, it's it's definitely difficult for some brothers to uh to process. And 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 one thing I see with 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 Christians, certain Christians, not all, I'm not gonna put mm -hmm. them all in the box, but certain Christians and most Hebrew Israelites, they can't even admit that they lost. It'd be bug no. it bugs me out. I'm like, dude, he you lost, but they cannot admit it. And so, you know, I definitely hear what you're saying, especially when we coming from the African paradigm, because it's been right. such a negative connotation put on Africa. Nobody wants to be African. You want to be a Hebrew. You want to be a Moor. You want to be uh, Arab. You want to be all these different. You want to be uh, Native American now. <laughs> you want to be all these, you know, you want to be everything but African. And it's like, but then when you start talking about a DNA test or something like that, oh, that's the white man's this, that's the white man's that. And you don't think the white man had nothing to do with the Bible. But, you know, it's like, you, the, the logic is, is so flawed. You just like, dude, like, like what, what, what concept of history is like you in a parallel universe? I'm a big comic book dude, and so you're like, hey, what part of the multiverse are you from where you were Native American? <laughs> but it, it's, it's crazy to me, so I definitely understand what you're saying. Well, you, you know, know what? I want to go back. I want to go, go, I, I go into what you were just saying there when you're talking about we want to be Moors, we want to be uh, Israelites, we want to be, you know, eyeballs and all this. I like to call that the Asiatic fanatics syndrome, right? Wow. That's what I like to call that. Okay. And most of that is because you're ashamed of being African. And now I embrace it. And when I tell you that I embrace it, um, you know, I'm, I'm a career guy. And when I was at work, a lady was coming up to me and 
telling me about how her day and how her day was at church. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And she's like, Chris, um, every time I talk to you about church, you seem not to really care. I said, no, 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 I'm African. And she was just all like, huh? I said, I'm African. She said, so you don't believe in Jesus? See how she automatically thought? Because I said, I'm African. Right. I, didn't. Right. I said, um, I says, uh, no. And she says, you don't believe in God? And I said, not the one you worship. And she says, what, do you, what is it that you practice? I said, I'm a, I'd like to play with him. I said, I'm African. I can worship a tree if I want to. That's how the creator made me. And then she was, just, she, she'll just be all like, they get scared and stuff. And it, it, but it, it, um, it piques their interest to come talk to you about it. Absolutely. And I was, I was just speaking with her about it the other day. And um, I said, our ancestors in ancient Kemet or Tameri saw Amin. And all the gods represented Amen. Amen is the unseen God. And she said, well, who was Amen? And I said, I said, well, let's turn to Matthew chapter four and let's find out who Amen is. And I said, well, here it is. Jesus gives the Lord's prayer, right? And then she says, yeah. And I said, our Father who art heaven, heaven give the name, thy, king, thy kingdom come, thy, king, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. Give us a day of daily bread. God is power, the power, glory, power forever and ever. In God's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> he said God's name was Amen. He did not holler out. He did not holler out and say his name was Yahweh. Jesus said his name was Amen. Mm. She says, no, Amen means let it be so. No, if he was speaking in the ancient Levant area, Amen and those priesthood temples were all through there. Amen only meant that one thing, the unseen God. And he said his name was Amen. So why is everybody playing to Jehovah or Yahweh? And when he was on the cross, he hollered out to El. El is nothing but another epithet of Amen. When you look at the Canaanite deity, El, you'll see the first thing you see on his head is an Enteth crown. And that is none other than Asar. Which is another epi which is another representation of who? Amen. Yeah. It's just that simple. There's it's there's no simple. way around it. It's that simple. And that's that's why I, like so, you know, I got a brother, uh good brother, uh, he a Christian. And we have we've had a back and forth now for about two years. And I mean he and I are good friends, but when we have our intellectual back and forth on spirituality. His contention is that the ancient people of Kemet believed in multiple deities. My contention is they believed that there was one being in existence. Period, That's right. That expressed itself throughout all of existence. Correct. The play the grass, the wind that blew, you and I, a tree, as you mentioned. Yeah. Etc. So he says, well, why did they build temples to Haru and Sekhmet because those were the aspects that they identified with. That's right. And he he cannot comprehend it. And I told him I, I, I use this analogy all the time. I say when I when I would get in trouble, I, my mother, for whatever reason, uh, she allowed us to call her by her first name. We called our grandparents uh, mama and dad. Mm -hmm. And so we call my mother by her first name. Her last name is Foster. So when I would get in trouble, my sister would always say, Miss Foster looking for you when I would get home. <laughs> that let me know that her energy had shifted from that first name basis to mm -hmm. now Miss Foster. And I had some 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 consequences I was going to have. I know where you're going with this one. Go and ahead. So my point being, she the same person who's showing a different aspect of herself. That's right. And Amun or the Netur, Netur, whatever connotation, Pata, Ra, Re, whatever connotation you want to give the divine creator. Mm -hmm. This when he when when something had to be dealt with from a wrathful aspect, we're talking about segment. That's right. We're talking about our, our higher self. We're talking about Haru, our lower self, Sutek. These were the aspects of the creator. Mm -hmm. And it's like he, he just can't comprehend it. 
if in, for when people identified with that aspect, they erected temples towards it. I mean, it's not complicated. No, it's not. And, and I equate it to, okay, you have a trinity that are three, it's, it's one God, but it's three people in, in, that make up this one God. And it's like, no, that's not, that's not, that's not the same thing. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I'm saying if you could if you could fathom that, this shouldn't be hard for you to fathom. Am, am, am I am I misunderstanding something? No. What you're clearly demonstrating is that the same entity, which is your mother, when she come looking for you, she becomes somebody else. The energy has shifted and she becomes something else. When we see um Amen, that's everything around us. But when we describe that one particular thing, that shoot, that's the air that he blew forth. That, that is how he creates. Shoot, we see Newt. Shu separates Newt from Geb. This is where you get the story of Adam and Eve from, where Shu lifts up. He lifts up Newt off of whom? Geb. When you see the biblical narrative, you see that this, the moisture separated the earth in the sky. Absolutely. This is where we, they get, this is where the Hebrews got it from. They got it from Shu, who raised up Newt over the, Newt, which represented of the heavens. Newt brought forth, that's why I brought that forth in that debate. Newt brought forth what? The sun. Behold, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. So these energies are all shifting and this is how they saw the creator because the creator is creation and creation continuously creates. So this is what they don't understand when they look at African spiritual concepts. What, what the Christian is looking for is one. God is not one. How can God be in all things? If God is in all things, then he's not one. Absolutely. You understand what I'm saying? I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there. And I also want to stress this again. When you look at the biblical narrative, what we see here is we see snakes talking, donkeys talking. Watch this. We see altars. We see talking trees. We see um, burning bushes. Those are all forms of animism. But they'll tell you animism in other cultures is evil and it's wicked. But here it is in your biblical narrative expressing themselves or forces of nature is expressing themselves to the biblical patriarchs. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, as long as I'm on this earth, I'm going to expose it and I'm going to show you all what's in your text. I don't know what I grand opening, grand closing, bro. Grand, you heard it. Grand opening, right. grand bro, closing. If that if that's not edification, I don't know what what else is, man. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. So my my last, I guess my last uh, question would be: mm -hmm. How has, or I, I, I guess not how has, or how did your transition? Now, well, let me let me let me rewind. Were you a Christian before you got into the the Hebrew Israelite move? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. So, if you can break down your your transition from Christian to Hebrew Israelite, and then finally your transition from Hebrew Israelite or Israelite to where you are now, and how that has affected. Uh, not only yourself, but the people around you, if, if that makes sense. Uh, my transition, um, growing up, I was a, uh, I was in many do dominations of Christianity. I was into the Apostolic, Baptist. Um, I was even a Catholic, going to a Catholic school, which my soul was rejecting that nonsense. You know what I'm saying? My, like, I got in cat trouble in Catholic school every day. I probably was the worst student in the school. Um, growing up Christian, um, what I notice is what it would do to black males, especially in a church Why I just stopped going to church was they became, a lot of black males were very effeminate. You know, my dad, he did not go to church, but my mother made us go to church. And I just remember seeing my dad, how strong he was. But when I went into the church, I saw a lot of uh, passive um, black males. 
um, a lot of my friends were very um, passive or uh, or very benign, if, if, if that's a word I want to use here, very benign, like, yeah, brother, you know, brother, just want to, you know, we don't want to focus on those things and what's going on, just focus on God, brother, you know. So I just happened, like I said up here, said, I was leaving basketball practice one day, and as I was going home, um, I was looking at this uh, television, and um, it was in the library, and I saw these guys, um, what were they, the Army of David or something like that? I can't remember who they were. And I was just all like, man, who's these dudes, right? And they were they were just opening up the Bible and it was just so different and it was electric how they was coming with it, right? Now, what makes that, what makes it so, wow, when you see it is because we grow up with the biblical narrative and we're being taught the biblical narrative a certain way. And right. then they'll come and show you a more nationalistic version of the Bible. And they'll say, this is you right here because Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 tells you so. So you're already used to the biblical paradigm and they just bring you into a more nationalistic approach with the, um, with the Hebrew Israelite doctrine. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it was, it's real easy to convert black people to become Hebrews and or Jews because there's, you're sitting up there saying these people are all black, right? And they've been You're looking at that book their the right. whole life anyway. So it's easy to make right. that leap. Right. Yeah. So when uh, I made my transition into it, I was not an Israelite fanatic, but I would always debate the Christian apologists. And I would always be debating them. And Christian apologists are nothing but Christian liars, right? But I remember I debated one and he said something. He said, what books are you reading, Chris? It always comes down to books. It always comes down to information. And I said, destruction, not destruction of black civilization, excuse me, Babylon of Timbuktu. I'm reading um, the Negro question part one, two. He said, all Hebrew Israelite literature. That's why you think you're a Jew, right? So the transition while I was there was more of a battlefront. When I was, when I was a Christian, I was in a more passive, benign mind state. When I became an Israelite, it's almost like a warlike mind state that they put you in. A lot of confusion, right? You back on those waters of Noah again. You know what I'm saying? We back on them, the, the flood and the earth again, right? And you're constantly at war and you're constantly fighting over scriptures or having biblical battles and stuff, right? And when I began to read the literature that I was telling you about earlier that this gentleman was producing for me and telling me to go read another book I tell anybody to go read is um, When Egypt Ruled the East. I want everybody to go read that book, whoever listens to this program. That will help you get out of it. Go read it. And I would begin to read these books and eventually I just phased out of it. You know, and it started with, why well, can't go outside on, on the Sabbath? I can't go outside on Saturday and enjoy enjoy myself. I used to be, sometimes I would sneak outside and feel guilty for being outside on Saturday. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I was just like, like why does God care about if I sleep with my wife on Saturday or have sex with my wife on Saturday? Wow. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So after a while, you step out of it. And when you, but you got one foot in the door, one foot out, right? One, And then finally, when you take that full step out, this when the flood comes at you again. That's when the flood comes after you. You become the pharaoh soldiers, right? They, everybody wants to flood you now and kill you because you're no longer in their paradigm. And they look at you as the enemy because now they know that, okay, he's no longer brainwashed or indoctrinated with the belief and being forced to believe. And now he can possibly influence others to get away from my camp or get away from my church. This is the key. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I left it and I stepped out of it, I stepped out of it for good. I'm done. There's nothing about the book is divine. There's nothing divine about it. And I always tell people, if there's anything we can do or how we can accept these texts again, accept it for what it is, a book of parables. And it's really a book that teaches about being chosen and not chosen. That's what the whole book is really about. Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve. David and Saul, Moses and the Pharaoh, Jesus and the Pharisees. All of these were, you had one person chosen, 
one person not. Now, when we look at those, those all are representations of our left and right side of our brain, yeah. right? The right side, which contains all your good thoughts and all your emotions and everything that you want to be accepting to, and the left side containing what? It contains all your all your your bad thoughts, all your contentions when you want to fight all the time, right? Now, when you look at the when you look at Haru and Set. Always see Heru on the right side, and you always see Set on the left side. So once again, they learned if these people were real, these Levites or these priests were real. They learned from your schools. As a matter of fact, the Book of Acts says, and Moses was learned in all the ways of the Egyptian. This is what these stories represent. Paul goes over that again when he talks about the flesh and the spirit. When we talk about the spirit, that the spirit is your inner, the spirit is your inner, inner Heru or your inner hero, right? This is what we don't understand. And your skin, <laughs> I'm getting into it, I know, I'm sorry. And no, your go skin, ahead, bro. go ahead. Your, your skin is that flesh that which you're always battling. This is where we get the term set tripping from because you're in your flesh and you're acting the fool. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what set represented. But as long as your inner hero is alive and it's being fed correctly, your inner hero or your Haru or Haru will always redeem his brother Set. This is where you get redemption from. And it's all phases of the mind, body, and the soul. And this is the only way I will teach that book. But of course, I'm always going back to my indigenous and my um, my African ancestors practices because that's how I began to understand this book for what it was. It went from zoomorphic to anthropomorphic. Mm. And that, I, bro, that was a powerful breakdown. And you hit the nail on the head for me when you when you said it's about uh, one person being chosen and one person being rejected. And just to add to the list, uh, Jacob and Esau. Ah, let's stop there. Jacob you know, and Esau, that's nothing but Hiru and Set, literally, because it yep. tells you Set, he was what? He was red and hairy. What does it tell you about Esau? He was red and hairy. Jacob being chosen, Esau not being chosen. Yeah. It's so simple. And they and they reverse it with David and Saul. Because yep. how did they describe David? Yep. He was uh Ruddy. Ruddy or what you know, and so and, and it's it's like you like you broke it down with like people don't realize in the comedic text, set isn't destroyed. No, he's, he's repurposed. Not. He yeah. he guides, he stands at the front of Ra's boat to defend right. against Apep, uh, That's right. uh, a being of chaos like him. Mm -hmm. And he defends Ra from that as he journeys through the night until he rises again mm -hmm. in the dawn. So he mm -hmm. is, that chaos inside of us is repurposed. Why? Because while we always want to stay in our higher self, sometimes that chaos rise up. That's and right. Repurpose it. That's sometimes right. we have to check somebody. That's right. But we have That's to right. also keep that in check so we don't do something that where we end up going to jail or putting right. ourselves in jeopardy. But right. that chaos is still there. It's just That's real right. purpose. That's so, right. bro, you, I mean, when I say you broke it down uh, excellently, I, I definitely uh, appreciate it. I do have one more question. I don't know if you got time for one. Sure, more. go ahead. What are, what are your thoughts on uh, Islam? Because I think we focus a lot on Christianity, mm -hmm. and rightfully so. Uh, one thing I want to, I do want to start doing, though, is edifying the people on, on Islam and its place in our history with regards to what they did to our African ancestors through slavery, through oppression, how that uh, corresponds with the NOI and they teach. And what are your thoughts on Islam overall? And if you want to segue that into the NOI, uh, go ahead with that as well. Um, when we look at Islam, once again, Islam is nothing more than an offshoot of the Abrahamic traditions. Um, it places its divinity or your divinity inside of a book, and it gives you a set of rules that you must follow. Um, one of the things that you were talking about when you were talking about you have no problem with the black church, 
I definitely have no problem with the black church at all. I would be a hypocrite if I said that I did. Um, Nation of Islam has done wonders. It has re-transformed men that are getting out of jail and it has repurposed them for their lives. So honestly, the NOI, I can never have a problem with the NOI. I just can't. It would be wrong of me to. It's just like I really have no problem with the Christians. It's just that I just feel like they're all misguided. The NOI, when you really look at them, you have to ask yourself, are they following a book or are they following a strong black man that is saying, hey, look, you need to be a man. You need to be a man of household. When you really look at it, the book is just a tool in the nation of Islam. It is just a tool. Right? The um, Honorable Louis Farrakhan um, or um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I will call him that because he's no longer here. He's with the ancestors. Um, they did great things for black men in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I just can't talk negative about them. That's just something I can't talk about. But when I look at the history of Islam and its traditions or its uh, atrocities inside of Africa, we got a problem. You understand what I'm saying? Because not only do they practice kidnapping over there in Libya and they sell children into slavery, they repurpose them so they can go back into Africa and kidnap more children. And this is going on as we speak today. And this is all through those traditions that you find in the Quran. When you open up the Quran and it says people who worship multiple gods, you can kill them and chop their heads off or slice them from ear to ear. And these are the things that are in those books. Now, when I look at it, um, the Pert M. Heru or the, the Torah or the Korans, whatever it is that when we're looking at these things, we need, I don't think these books are going to go anywhere, mainly the Torah and the Quran, right? I think we need to repurpose these books as they have repurposed us in these uh, divisions of um, the Abrahamic traditions. And we need to look what's in these books and say, okay, we can use this, we can take this, and we can throw it out. Because it's not the word of God if man has um, retranslated it and it's no longer holy or Kadesh. Um, the NOI, as for example, with any institute run by men, you're going to have problems. There's no such thing as a perfect man on this earth. Our pharaohs or insuits were not perfect, you know. Um, so as much as many mistakes ha that they have made, they have done a lot of good things. So I, I hope I'm answering this correctly for you, but if you want me to destroy the, the text, oh yes, I can do that too. But uh, <laughs> um, as far as the NOI, I have no problem with the NOI. Um, the direction they're headed in now, I'm a little bit confused with what they're doing. I'm not really seeing them out there, especially with the cop killings and things like that. It seems like Minister Farrakhan, maybe he's getting old. Um, and he's not able to tour as much as he used to. But um, he was always able to raise the spirit up in all of us because he was such an electric speaker. Absolutely. And that's how a lot of us were taught. Um, we were taught through speeches. You look at the biblical narrative, the Sermon on the Mount. Th those are all speeches and electrifying speeches. M M Martin Luther King, um, I Have a Dream speech. My favorite speech of all time, which is The Ballad and the Bullet by Malcolm X. Um, he too was a Muslim. So I have no problem with the Nation of Islam because some of our greatest leaders or and orators and teachers have come right out of that school. So, yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I hey, I definitely respect your answer. And I think you and I are on the same page with that. I respect the nation for what they've done, building up black men and women, building up uh, pillars in the community, setting mm -hmm. up black businesses, et cetera. Yep. Um, I, and that's another reason why I don't really have an issue with the black church because I feel like black people are the most spiritual people on the planet. That's right. We can take Islam. We can take Christianity. That's right. We can take uh, Judaism, Buddhism, and whatever we want to take, and we can put our spin, our swagger on it and make it our own. Because when you go to the nation, it ain't like when you go to uh, an Arab mosque. That's right. Uh, when you go to a black church, it ain't like That's when right. you go to a white church. That's right. That's you know right. what I mean? Hebrew right. Israelites ain't like uh, the synagogue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because we put our own swagger on things. That's I right. I think that the the rejection of Africa and African traditions is where uh, 
we kind of stand in deference uh, with that. But uh, but I respect, like you said, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I respect uh, Louis Farrakhan and what he's done and what he's built. My only issue with the nation is the two men who seem to revere Africa uh, in, in the history of the organization were both ostracized. Uh, Khaled. Khaled and Malcolm. Um, yeah, I don't think yeah, that's a sure. sense. Yeah. Uh, and I will we'll leave it at that. We're yes, sir. To that. Uh, as far as Islam overall, I think that in our critiques against these Abrahamic religions, I think that we can definitely start giving Islam more work than we do um, with regards to what, they, what they've done to our people and what they continue to do to our people. That's right. Uh, the sub-Saharan slave trade still goes on. Traded our, our babies, our male babies, raped our women, uh, put fezes on their head. I'm talking to y'all, Moors. Uh, and uh -oh. put, them, put, put them in their <laughs> armies. If everybody, anybody who watched Game of Thrones and saw the unsullied army, who those, were, those soldiers who didn't have penises, that was inspired by what Arabs did to our people. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, we have that aspect that I think we can definitely go at their heads with and the fact that they are still doing it to this day. It has not stopped. Day. That's right. So um, so that's something we can get into. And then when we talk about Judaism proper, not the Hebrew Israelites, but we can talk about how, how Jews contributed to the enslavement of our direct ancestors who came over here on slave ships and how they contributed to it business-wise, through insurance company ships, et cetera. So I think we can knock all their heads off. I think we focus on Christianity a lot and deservedly so, but when it comes to the Abrahamic faiths, none of them have been kind to our people. None so, of them. But uh, once again, bro, I man, when I say I thank you, do I owe for, for coming on and uh, educating the people, uh, I am definitely uh, grateful to you for that. Uh, it's been 100% edifying. Uh, if you can, real quick, let the people know where they can find you, what you're going to be uh, doing next, and uh, we'll go ahead and get out of here. Um, you guys can find me at Andreas Harris. That's on YouTube. Um, what I'll be doing is I'm, I'm recreating my channel, um, and I'm going to learn how to put um, better and more proper content on there. Um, and I'm going to be doing a lot more um, presentations on history on some things that we have all gotten wrong. Um, and um, that's where you guys can find me at. You guys can also check out my debates over there at um, Solar Vision Debate League. Um, let me see, um, you guys can check me out over here with this brother. I hope, hopefully we can do more work with this brother um, in the future moving forward. Um, and you guys, make sure you guys like and subscribe to Paradigm Shift Television 314. And um, one more time, man, it's been a pleasure. Um, I really enjoyed coming on here. Um, this was better than what I thought it was going to be. Like, yo, this was excellent. I really enjoyed myself here because um, had it been really, maybe I'd come back through and do a, um, some screen share presentations for, for your audience. And um, I can do them live on air so I can begin to show um, not just African spiritualities, um, but show what a lot of these mythologies are teaching when we're dealing with the um, contentions of Haru and Set, so on and so on. So once again, guys, you can check me out at Andreas Harris um, Television um, or MVP TV, Chris Harris MVP um, Television over there at YouTube. Um, come check me out, like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Um, the channel is continuously growing. Um, I'm going to continue to give it 100% in um, everything that I do. And I want to um, thank Brother Pianchi here for bringing me on. I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed myself tonight. So, No, no doubt. Peace. Bro, like I said, we, we appreciate you coming on, man. I know you, uh, you're busy, you know, with your everyday life. And then you're in demand with everything you're doing. So taking the time out to come on our chat on this platform was greatly appreciated. And everybody, yeah. please check him out on his platform. Check out his debates on uh solar mind or solar vision debate league mm -hmm. uh go to his youtube page andreas harris subscribe uh check out the, the presentations and like the brother said we definitely looking forward to having them back over here and with that family we're gonna close out come back check us out paradigm shift tv 314 this is your brother pianki fatama tulu neferam moon Ra, and that's hotel we'll see y'all next time peace peace brother